Do you guys grab your Bibles and join me this evening? We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, as we continue, we're making our way through here, chapter by chapter. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles around you, and I ask you to grab hold of one of those. As we pick up this evening and just continue our study of what the, this letter has for us, as we do that, I want you to understand this. It's a truth that many have noted. In fact, so often said that in one sense, we're not even sure who, where their quote, quote originates, but it's a truth that nevertheless just rings true across so many lives, that you make your choices, and then your choices make you. I mean, I want you to think about just in one sense that reality. You make your choices, and life is that. I mean, so often we find ourselves just standing at crossroads, trying to make decisions, choices that stand before us, and yet the reality stands absolutely resolute. You make those choices. And those choices will fashion your life. Those choices will, will shape who you are. Now, I want to just encourage at the very outset, there's grace. God can rescue that does never make us just slap hazard about the whole thing that we'd come to it and say, no, we got to move into this really carefully. And that's where we are this evening. See, I think about it. We come into 1 Corinthians 10 and we continue a study that actually was taking place for three chapters. And it's kind of a comical thing because in one sense, the whole thing has to do with a question that they'd asked Paul. They'd written to Paul who had planted the church there in Corinth and they'd asked him, you know, is it okay for us to eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols? It was a cultural problem. It's not a specific issue that probably anybody in this room has even just even close to ever dealt with. If you haven't read your Bibles, you wouldn't even know it was an issue. But it was. We've talked about it for the last two weeks, and so I won't spend a lot of time on the backdrop of that. If you've missed it, it would be an encouragement to go back and get those studies. Suffice it to say in this way that Corinth was an idolatrous city. Idols, temples everywhere. One of the ramifications of that was that the sacrifices that people were making in these idol temples, well, the priests were running a sideline business. I mean, in one sense, they had so much meat, they were selling the meat, you know, both in markets and other places. And so in a very practical way, the best meat at the best prices was the meat that had been sacrificed to an idol that the temples had had this and now they're selling it in the markets. And now these Christians are wondering, is that okay for us to do that? I mean, is it okay for us to eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol? And addressing this single issue, God helps us to open up and see a hundred, a thousand, 10,000 issues. Because understand this, it brings to an issue those areas in our lives that have been termed as gray areas. We've given that definition for the last two weeks. Let me do so quickly. When we think about gray areas, maybe you understand, but I want to be very, very plain what we're talking about. There are things in life that biblically, they're black and white. There is no wiggle room. There's no, well, you know, I'm kind of, no, there are things that are laid out in scripture that we absolutely know they're the right thing. They're white in that sense. Things that God would absolutely have for us. There are things that are absolutely wrong. The Bible's abundantly clear. In fact, 1 Corinthians is. So, I mean, even in the context of this letter, dealing with and saying there are things that have no place in a Christian's life. There are things that they're not gray. They're not a personal decision. If you're going to live a life surrendered to God, they're not choices. It's your will be done, and it's clear. That said, there are and so many things that, well, the Bible doesn't specifically deal with. They're kind of in between. They're not specifically said to be good things, nor are they specifically said to be bad things. So again, they find themselves in gray areas. Again, they number in the thousands of questions that Christians wrestle with, choices over clothing and style and music and, and, and every other possibility that would be there. Is this okay for me to do? Is this something that I should be going down? Is, is this okay in my life, Christians ask? And that's what Paul's been dealing with. And I want to tell you again, it's no sideline issue. Though again, you're not wrestling with the question about whether you should sacrifice to idols. You face such decisions every week. You face decisions that they're not clear in the Bible and you make those decisions. And in so doing, well, can I say it again, what I said at the outset? You make those choices. And then those choices are making you. 
So how do we do that? I mean, how do we actually make such decisions when the Bible's not abundantly plain? Well, again, that's what he's been talking about, but perhaps he sums it up for us right in the middle of our chapter. Gaze on down with it for me a moment to verse 23 of chapter 10. Paul gives it to us in several principles. In verse 23 of chapter 10, he says it this way, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. In some ways, you could sum up all three of these chapters with those three principles. All things are lawful. Paul tells us that in, when the, in these gray areas, you know, they're, 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 they're okay. But then the question for us is, is it helpful? Is it good for me? Is it something that's going to you know, move my life forward? Does it edify? Does it, does it help others? And those three questions become, in many ways, just the, the main premises that go into these three chapters. All things are lawful. Again, gray areas are not bad. There's no way to sit there and say, okay, that's, that's, you can't do that. That's sin. In fact, he had pointed that out to them. He says, you know, that they understood that an idol was nothing. It, it wasn't going to hurt a Christian to eat meat sacrificed to an idol. It wasn't like he was going to get some kind of spiritual cooties or, I mean, there wasn't any part of it that was going to be there. He says, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's okay. And so Paul says, it's all lawful. Again, this is in the context of gray areas. He's not talking black and white. I mean, that's hopefully again clear because he just has said that earlier on in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians. There are things that are not okay. But when it comes to things that the Bible doesn't say no to, there's no way to make a rule. There's no way to make a law. Everything's okay if, it's, if, it's, if the Bible says it's, it's not there. Gray areas, in that sense, can't be labeled as bad. But then he asks the question, is it helpful for me? Is it good for me? All things are lawful for me, he says, but that's not the question that I should be asking. See, we said it last week, and I say it again just briefly. Probably every Christian has said it at some point in their life. Is it okay for me to be a Christian and do fill in the blank, whatever that is? I mean, is it, I mean it's almost asking, like, how far can I go and still be a Christian? I mean, how much can I push the envelope? How far can I do what wrong and still get away with it and still be okay spiritually? It's kind of a, a question that we probably have all asked at times, but it's the wrong question. He's not asking, how much can I get away with? He's saying, well, what we should be asking, is this, is this good for me? Is this going to help me? Is this going to help me do that? Is it going to help me reach everything that I have for me? Is it going to help me in my pursuing all that God has for my life? Or is it going to hurt in me pursuing all that God has for my life? Well, let's think about that for a moment, because in one sense, that's kind of where we were. We talked about rights last week and laying down our rights that kind of roll into this. But at the first part of this chapter, this is what he comes back to. And I suppose I ask it of you. Do you want everything that God has for your life? I mean, if you could see it. If God were to just, you know, place it up here and said, okay, this is everything I have for your life. Do you want it? And again, it's kind of a, a tricky question, I suppose, but I would think in one sense, for at least in part, you wouldn't be here tonight if that wasn't at least some of what you were wanting. That in some ways you're thinking, I, I, I do kind of want that. I mean, at least I, I, I should want that. I should be able to say, God, I want your will for my life. And so he kind of challenges us in that sense, giving us this idea that we should be seeking to obtain everything that God has for us. It's really how it ended in the last chapter. So let's back up just for a moment. In verse 24 of chapter 9, he says it this way. It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Lots of interesting nuggets within those verses, but the main principle is pretty clear, right? He says, in one sense, it should be the same way an athlete pursues a prize. 
that in one sense we ought to be those who, in the same way that we seek to do that, that in the same way an athlete would say, you know, I'm competing. I, I want to win. Oh, maybe it's an Olympic medal. Maybe it's, you know, something that they're longing for. And in one sense, if you know anybody who is so driven, who has a passion to obtain something, you know, there are so many sacrifices they make. And they do it not because it's wrong for them to do some of those other things, but it doesn't help them. I mean, there are things that they give up. There are foods that they don't eat. There are, you know, choices that they, 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 they just give themselves away to. And you could ask them, like, you know, it's not wrong for you to, you know, eat that or have that gallon of ice cream or, or whatever. It's not wrong for you to do that. And they say, no, it's not wrong. You know, I, I could do that. But it might cost me. It, it could cost me what I'm really after. And I'm willing to lay those things down, not because I can't, it's not like somehow I, I have this guilt complex where I'm like, no, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. You know, I, I'm after something. I, I want all that God has for me. Hey, can I give it to you just this way? I, I wonder how that comes across in your life. See, I'm hoping that for many of you, it's choices you make. There are things I'm hoping you don't do. There are things, again, that are sinful. Those are clear. But even more than that, things that you don't do because you just know they're not helpful to your Christian life. I hope that's true in your life. But I'm kind of curious how you communicate that. I remember it was fairly early in my Christian life. I was working at a bank in Albuquerque. And, you know, we were going through just, you know, they, they, they constantly kind of razzed me about my faith, but they kind of still were trying to reach out to me. And so they kept inviting me to happy hour, you know, like, hey, we just going to go to happy hour. Like, we all go to happy hour and let's all go to happy hour, Jim. And why? And I, and I don't, I don't. And I remember one of them just, you know, continuing to invite me and I continued to say no. And so they were inviting me at one point. And they said, we're going to go to happy. And I said, oh, oh yeah, you're one of those Christians. You're not allowed to do that, are you? And I remember just hearing their voice and the way they said it. And it just struck me as, no, that's totally not the way it is for me. I said, you, you, you say that as if it's some kind of bad thing. It's, you under, gotta understand, for me, it's not that I, you know, there are things, it's not that there's all these negatives in my life. I don't want those things. I want to please God. I want to walk in his ways. I'm, it's not this idea of, I can't, but I don't want to. And I remember trying to communicate it, and I remember him just looking at me and going, huh, Wow. Okay. I mean, but it, it turned into an incredible witnessing opportunity. We had several more opportunities to talk about it. But I remember just trying to tell him, you know, you, you get it all wrong. I mean, and, and the problem is that sometimes Christians f just foist such opportunities because they kind of say it that way. Yeah, I can't really do those things. You know, as Christians, we're not really allowed to have fun. You know, that's kind of the way it is. And yeah, I'd really like to go and do that with you. But you know, you know, and, and, and we communicate something instead of saying, no, you don't understand. I, I'm after a prize. I'm after something that's worth more to me than anything else that you could lay before me. I want God's will for my life. And I'm, I'm afraid of missing that. That's what Paul's saying. He says, I don't want to preach to everybody else about how all these things are, and then I would be disqualified. That I would, in that sense, miss it. And he's not here worried about losing his salvation. He's worried about losing the best that God would have for his life the best that God would have there. And, and so as he's communicating that to us, he, you know, he just draws us to this. I think a way the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews would say it, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Again, he lays it out as this picture of saying, you know, let's just, anything that's keeping us from winning, it's about that. It's about running a different kind of race. It's about doing that. And as he lays that out to us, he, he draws us now at the beginning of chapter 10 to kind of see some Old Testament pictures and warnings. Verse 1 of chapter 10, he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For the rock, for, the, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Hey, let me come, keep going for a moment, and then we'll come back and talk about that. It says, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. 
tells us there in verse 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Hey, quick Bible study help. He's telling us that when we read the incredible stories of the Old Testament, they are more than just accounts of history. That what God wrote for us, the way that he wrote it, not only gives us an account of what God did in the ages gone by, but it was written down in such a way that it would be a challenge to us. That we would see through those windows and through the pictures of the Old Testament, the lessons that God would have for us. It's a clear just, just admonition from God that you and I would approach just even the Old Testament and the accounts there that way that we wouldn't just read them as stories, but they would be there. This happened to them as an example for us. Well, with that in mind, you go back again to verses 1 through 5. We've talked about this in days past, so I'm not going to go over it in great detail. If you have questions, you can ask. But he looks back at what God did in the, in the lives of the children of Israel. He says, all our fathers were under the cloud, in verse 1, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He takes us back to the book of Exodus, to God bringing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He says, God took all of us. He took all the people of Israel, and they all came out, and they were under the cloud, which is the cloud is a picture of God's presence. They were baptized by going through the Red Sea, kind of into Moses. They partook of the the sustenance that God was giving them, which he tells us is pictures of what we have in Christ. In many ways, he's tying into pictures that are true in our lives, and and he's telling us that in one sense, they were walking in all of this. Now, if this is making sense, what I want you to understand is he's telling us, from a New Testament terminology, he would say, you know, all these guys, all of them were, were, were Christians. I mean, when they, they, they were baptized into, into this, they were partaking of Christ, they, you know, they were enjoying that reality of all that God had for them, and he's letting us understand, at least the analogy, is that they were pictures of people who were Christians. That in one sense, you go back to the book of Exodus, and you see just the incredible typology of, of the Passover lamb being a picture of the cross, of the Red Sea being a picture of baptism, of again, just the way that God provided to, for them being pictures of how Christ meets us and now. It's an incredible picture. But here's the reality that is meant to clench in your life and mine, is what he tells us in verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. If you're reading with us in the book of Numbers, you just read this. This is like, you're, you're right on the same page. Because there they were, they were at the very borders of the land of, of Israel. Went through and they selected just spies that would go into the land to go in and find just the land that God had for them. Twelve of them came back out and they said, it's a great, it would be great. It's a great land, it's, it would be wonderful if we could have it, but it's just too hard. The, the armies are too big, we'll never be able to have it. And they rebelled. And then God made a declaration. He said, fine. You don't want it. You can't have it. You don't want what I have for you. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. They had been pressing this for for over and over. He said, you've tested me 10 times. You've pressed over and over and over again. He says, if you don't want what I have for you, you can't have it. And he tells them they're not going to go into the land. Instead, they're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Except for two. Joshua and Caleb. There were two of the spies that came back and they gave a good report. And they said, we could do it. I mean, if God has it for us, we could do it. We could have all that God had. He says, we could have all that that is. We could, we could walk in all that that would be. But God says, for the rest of them, they're not going to be able to go in. They're not going to be able to, in that sense, have all that that is. Now, as we kind of think about it from, again, a New Testament analogy, this isn't, again, a picture of them losing their salvation. It isn't a picture of, saying, of God saying, okay, I'm just going to you know, just judge all of you or, and move you to a place that you wouldn't have anything like that because for the next 40 years, God takes care of them every single day. Every day he leads them by a pillar of cloud and pillar of fire by night. Every day he provides for them manna. Every day he cares for this rabble. They are a picture of people who are saved but they don't get it. They don't get God's best for their life. Now again, if, this, if you're tracking for a moment, in one sense, the, 
the sheer numbers of it is quite scary. I mean, when you, when you think about the understatement of verse 5, but with most of them, God was not well pleased. With most of them? We're talking probably in the millions and two obtained. Two of them obtained what God had for them. Now, I don't want to lay that as some kind of scary statistical average that you know, only two Christians out of millions actually obtain everything that God has for them. It might actually be true, but I don't think it's meant to be discouraging, but it also is also meant to absolutely shake you right now because maybe you haven't thought it through that way. Maybe you've kind of been, well, you know, I'll have what God has for my life. I mean, he's going to get me there. I mean, I mean, surely I won't miss it. Most of them didn't. Most of those who are in the book of Exodus, this Old Testament picture, they didn't gain it. They, they missed out on what God has. Most of them missed it. God would have had more for their life. And I want to tell you right now, I don't know where that is in your life, but it's meant to be where you could almost think, okay, that's what I want. I mean, I shouldn't be living with, you know, how much can I get away with? But I should be saying, I want everything that God has for my life. I don't want God to look upon me and say, you know, I would have given you more. There would have been things I could have showed you. There would have been ways I could have used your life, but you settled for complacency. You settled for something that was altogether miserable. You, you, you missed out on all that that was. Well, he gives us this Old Testament warning, just letting us know that most of them missed God's best that most of them failed to obtain everything that God has. And so he's telling us again, as we make those choices, there's a sense that to look upon it and say, we don't want to do that. We don't want to cause that to happen. And so he reminds us a little bit of the story. Verse 6, now all these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Said simply, we shouldn't want bad things. We shouldn't want those things that are bad for us. We should want what's good for our lives. We shouldn't want those things that, that kind of stand on the border of what God would have. We should want what's good for our lives. And then he gives us four examples out of the book of Numbers and the book of Exodus. He says, do not become idolaters, as were some of them. As, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank, and they rose up to play. He says, you don't want to give yourself into idolatry. You don't want to find yourself you know, pursuing things that are beyond what God would have. And he takes us back to the golden calf, to when Moses goes up the, the mountain, and then Aaron comes, and he, and, he, and, he, and he sets up this golden calf, and they begin to kind of move into idolatry. So you don't want that to be you, because that would keep you from having everything that God would have for you. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and fell in one day 23,000, in one day 23,000 fell. It says we wouldn't want to play with immorality, Again, we're not just talking about blatant sin because that's already been addressed as a black area. But there are things that are just, they're border areas and they would pull us away from all that God would have for us. They would, they would just mar our lives and mess us up from having everything that God would want for our lives. And, and he reminds of, of, of just them doing it, of the, of the immorality that, that they began to walk in and walking in them and God just bringing judgment upon them for that. Nor let us tempt Christ, in verse 9. As some, of them, some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Hey, pause. Again, and maybe I, just in case I'm losing you. See, when we think about it right now, he says, you know, don't give in to things that are bad for you. We ought not lust for those things. We shouldn't want bad things. I mean, idolatry, immorality, it's entirely possible that right now you're more comfortable than you should be. See, for some of you, are like, uh, no problem. It's not really, you know, idols don't really, I'm not that interested in idols, immorality. No, I've kind of figured that out. That's a bad thing. Our world is kind of marred, they just got that right. But it was more than that. It was also tempting Christ. It says, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Has an idea of tempting him, of impatience, of struggling under it, it's the story of the serpents. And again, you have it in the book of Numbers when it tells us that they began to become discouraged because they were just frustrated at how slow things seemed to be going. And out of that frustration, they began to complain and press and become bitter. And in that bitterness, God struck them with snakes that would just say, it caused them to be missing what God would have for them. Nor, he says, even let us complain. As some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. 
okay, ow. I mean, it's, you just got to be there for a moment and think, okay, well, that's getting a little bit more, I mean, can, it, just complaining, just complaining about life and complaining about the road that God has us on could actually, yeah, that, those are the things that fed their discouragement. Those are the things that caused them to get to the place that when the choice was to be made about going into the land, it had whittled down their soul. He says, these things, we get a chance to look back and say, those are not the things that we want. Those things would be altogether bad for us, and they're written for us in the Old Testament. Hey, the stories are found there. If you're interested in any of those, go back and pursue them. But understand this, verse 11, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. These are there for us so that we don't do that, so we don't walk in that. And he gives us an incredible promise and a serious warning. Verse 12, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you except such as common to man. Pause again and just catch it with me. Don't think this doesn't apply to you. I mean, if you think you're doing fine, if you're listening to me even so far, and you're like, not a problem, got it, you know, I'm I'm there. He says, if you think you're doing okay, then you're not really paying attention. That's this ought to be a little bit scary. If it was scary for the apostle Paul, if he was worried about missing what God had for him, Said, I don't want to be disqualified. I don't want something to keep me back from everything that God has for me. It should be so for you. If you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Because no temptation is overtaking you, except that such is common to man. That in one sense, as we think about temptation, it's so normal. I mean, all of us face temptation. In fact, there's incredible truths that we could draw out of this verse, and we've done so on other occasions. But I just remind you that in one sense, this applies to you. There, we are facing temptation. We have these things that would warn us away from it, but he gives us an incredible promise. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God always makes a way out. There's not anything in our lives that would have the just ability to, to destroy and mar what God had for our life if we wouldn't say, God, I want, I want out. I want, I want your rescue because I want what you have for my life. I don't want this to take it away from me. And he's saying, you know, that God is so faithful. He always provides. It doesn't have to destroy you. It doesn't have to mar you. It doesn't have to keep you back from what God would have for your life. He's promising us that this could be there. He's promising us that God will be incredibly faithful. And again, we could spend the rest of the evening right there. But I just want to tell you it's true. Prove it out. Prove it in your life. When you're facing those temptations, just ask, okay, God, where is the way out? I guarantee you he'll provide one. doesn't mean it's always easy. Sometimes it's like Joseph running, but there's a way out. And he'll provide it. I mean, I just just call you to it. I mean, this incredible promise Now, before he leaves this, he's going to give us one other quick thought, and and we'll go back to the other principle. But as we think about this, again, the question he's asking, is is it helpful? Is this good for me? Is this going to, you know, propel me into everything that God has for me? And he just gives one other thing that you can't have it both ways. And it's a little bit of of a complicated section, but we're going to cover it briefly. Pick it up with me there in verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to you as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, through the, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to an idol is anything? I mean, is that what he's saying? No, that's not what he's saying. Rather that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And there's some great details in there, but I'm going to give it to you kind of simply. The idea that he just simply says, as clear as he can say it, is that you can't have it both ways. You can't serve God and that. See, it could have been that there were people there in the city city of Corinth, in the church of Corinth, that were kind of thinking, well, you know, I'll come to church. 
and, and do this. Then I'm going to go over to my idol temple and serve the idol as well. I'll eat the meat sacrificed to idols, but I'll also kind of embrace both. And he says, you can't do that. Now, he's not saying that you can't eat meat sacrificed to idols. He already said that. He will say that again in a couple of verses. But he is saying, you can't embrace that idol and embrace God. You can't have it both ways. You can't serve God and those. I mean, you can't do it that way. That's not a gray area. That's not there. And, and some would take this. And he just says, you know, you can't do that. You know, he says, I speak to you as wise men. Judge this. You can't have it that way. He says, you know, you, you can't do it that way. You cannot drink, in verse 21, the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. You can't enjoy just this fellowship with Christ and at the same moment be living this double life, embracing, embracing the idol that was there in Corinth or, or whatever that would be in your life. Can't be done. And that's not what he's saying. And, and he just wants to say you can't have it that way. It can't be done that way. Or if you are, you're provoking the Lord to jealousy. It'd be a scary place to go into. Well, let it be a warning that's there. And again, if you want more, just I give it to you there to pursue. But we think about it. Again, he's asking us, you know, just letting us understand this, that we cannot serve God. We cannot serve that him and demons. But the point that he's driving home here is, is it good for me? Because that's what he says next. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. I mean, maybe I could do some of these things. But would it really help me gain what God has for my life? I mean, that's really the far more serious of questions. And then he comes back to where he began. For you guys who were here a couple weeks ago in chapter 8, he talked about it, you know, that knowledge puffs up. He says, love edifies. That we're more concerned about others. And he comes back to, he says, does it edify others? Does it affect them? And how does it affect them individually? And, and he, he tells us this again, all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Edify means to build up or make strong or help others. It says, let no one seek his own, but each one his, uh, the other's well-being. It gives it to us as we think that through, and even how it kind of processes out, he kind of gives it to us this way. Kind of catch it there in verse 25. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's in, in all of its fullness. He says, you get to buy meat, don't even worry about it. It's not, it's not you know, again, meat sacrificed to idols, not going to hurt you. Don't even make it a big deal. I mean, God is our provider. And he kind of quotes from that, that, you know, just that God is just kind of recognizing him as that and says, you know, you could do that. You know, that in that sense, it's not going to bother you. Don't even make it a big deal. But in verse 27, if any of you who do not believe, if any, if any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you, for the conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord in all of its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. If your brain is tracking, and I hope it is for some of you, Again, he's, he's laying this out. He's letting us know that in one sense, this isn't a law. This is situational. This is personal. Again, I, I say it kind of carefully that way because, you know, it, some would say, okay, is this kind of situational ethics? Well, yes and no. I mean, there are things that are black and white in the Christian life, but there are things that really are determined by that. But understand this again, it's not a law. You can't make a law. It's personal. He says, what you need to be thinking about is how is this going to affect the person that I'm with right now? I mean, that's really what's making my decision. You know, you know is, is this going to, you know, if they said it before me and nobody mentions it, I'm just going to eat the meat. It's not a big deal. I'm not worried about it. But if they're preoccupied with it, well, you know, it is meat sacrificed to idols. And you're, and again, it's not that they just use the words, but it's obvious that they're really concerned about it. It says, well, I, I want, I don't, I'm not going to do anything that would stumble you. I'm not going to do anything that, because I'm more concerned about your life and, and your life in doing that. And, and he calls us to have this, way of making decisions that's not based on a legal or, or law-based mentality, but a love-based mentality. And I want to tell you that that's, that's harder and yet more wonderful way of living than coming up with a set of rules. We talked about that the first week, so if you want to go back to it and get it, but sometimes we as Christians are we're prone to do that. Let's just make a list. Let's, let's make a list of what I can't do and a list of what I can't do, and then we're done. He says, no, I want you to actually be care. I want you to, to care about people, which means you're going to have to know them, which means you're going to have to listen to them, 
which means you're going to have to kind of care about where they are and how they see life and, and, and how that's affecting them. And then you're going to have to think through, okay, how are my choices going to affect their choices? You know, I, and because I, I'm, going to, I'm going to help that determine what I do. And, and it's a far more involved process, but it's so much more wonderful because it's based on love. Now, again, he almost asks it, why should that affect my choices? That's what he says almost in a kind of a question if you and I were asking it. In, in the middle of verse 29, for why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I, am I evil spoken of for the food which I give thanks? It's, a, it's as if we're asking the question, why should what somebody else thinks affect my choices? If it doesn't bother me, and if it really doesn't, if, if I'm really good with it, and it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm totally not, not bothered by this. I'm, I'm great with it. Why should my choices be affected by other people's lives? And, and he just challenges us with this thought. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. He says, when we come down to life, I mean, it's not about our pleasure. We're not living for that. We're living for God's glory. I mean, if you're really after that, God, I just want you to be pleased. God, I want... I, I want to live for your pleasure and I, I want to walk in all that that is. And it's a, a principle that's held all the way through scripture. Hey, that, that's what I should want. It's not about me, it's about God. It says, whatever I do, I should do for God's glory. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit. So I'm not trying to hurt anybody because I really care about other people. I really care about other people. And he brings us back, well, if I can say it again this way, for you guys who were here in the first week, to where we began. There are really two main commands, are there not? You saw it on the, door, the wall when you came in, maybe. When Jesus was asked, what's, he was asked, what's the great commandment? He says, the first commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do these two things, and the rest of it's just details. And that's what he's telling us here. Hey, you know what? It's not about me. I'm not the first question that should be asked. Not whether I like it or I want it or I'm okay with it. No, the first question that should be asked is, God, am I pleasing to you? I want to do everything I am to live for your pleasure. And secondly, I want to think about other people because that's who we are. But we should be seeking that for the profit of many that they may be saved, seeking that they would be blessed, that they could have all that that is. That what we should long for is that in a sense of a place where we're really walking in that. You know, because in one sense, thinking it's not about just me. I should be thinking, so how's this going to affect them? I mean, I, again, I'm not bound by other people's ch choices or the way that they think about things. It, again, if this sounds simplistic to you, I need to tell you, it's a lot more that it's not. I, I think about it, and we talked about it again, I think it was last week, the week before. It doesn't mean we you know, live for people's approval or trying to make everybody happy. Jesus didn't. He violated their traditions. He did what they considered work on the Sabbath. It wasn't. But he didn't live in this place where he was trapped by that, but he absolutely loved them. And, and, and that motivated the decisions where at times there were things that you did and don't do. You know, it doesn't mean that we're always just, well, I don't want to ever rock the boat. I don't ever, you know, I, you know, trying to make people happy. No, that's not it at all. I'm not trying to make everybody happy. I'm trying to make God happy. And I'm worried about your soul. And if, there'll be decisions I make. And, and I want to be driven by that in such a way that it works that. I mean, that's what he's telling us. He's, he's telling us that in that sense, when we think about it, that these are the ways that we should work it through. Now, maybe you are. Maybe I'm saying some of these things and I'm just kind of coming alongside and encouraging stuff that's already there, but I'm just going to give a, just this thought. I mean, maybe this is like nothing you ever wrestle with. And if you don't, I'm just going to tell you, something's wrong. I don't mean that in a mean way. But either you're living legalistically, you've come up with a list of rules and you've made it overly simplistic, or you're living for yourself and you don't, ever, you don't even think about these things. But if you get it right, I mean, it comes down to this place that we're faced with decisions every week. Things that are not necessarily good or bad. And they're fine. All things are lawful for me. I'm not going to come up with a list and all of a sudden they become bad. But I, but I should be thinking it through. Okay, so 
How would this affect my soul? I mean, how is this going to, is, is this going to help me or hurt me on everything that God would have for my life? And how would this affect other people? I mean, I want to please God. I want to have everything that he has for me. And I want to care about other people. And I want to just tell you, this is meant to be something that's actively taking place in your life. And again, if it's not, then by God's grace, I hope it becomes so. Whether again, you're living legalistically and you have a list of rules that have made it overly simplistic in a way that's not God. Or you're living entirely selfishly which is missing everything that God would have for your life. No, it moves us into a place that's healthy and whole and, and this place where we, we ought to be wrestling through these things. Where in one sense we look on this and think, okay, I should be able to say that. There ought to be things that I should look at my life and say, you know, it's fine. All things are lawful for me. I could do that if I wanted to. I just don't want to <laughs> because I want what God has for my life. I could do that if I wanted to, but I'm not gonna do it because it might hurt this person right here. I mean, maybe later, I, if they're not here, I, mean, you know, I can eat that meat because they're not here, but I'm more concerned about them right now because I've been listening to them and I know where they are and I know what concerns them and I want to do everything I can to help them get to Jesus. I want to live that way. I think about all that that is and calling us to live a life where it's for God, where in one sense, as he tries to answer the question there in verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, that it's lived for such pleasure. I think about it, and as we kind of process this through, I, I, I want to go back, and, and I think about just that verse that we read a moment ago, and if, just put it on the screen there in verse 16. As in part of him kind of saying, you know, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? We're going to move towards taking communion this evening. It's the last Wednesday night of the month, and that's when we take communion on our Wednesday nights. And yet I draw you again to the context with which he said this. The point of it was, in one sense, him saying, you, you can't have God and something else. You can't have the Lord and the cup of demons. That in one sense, we could almost say, he's saying, you know, be all in. <laughs> I mean, that in one sense, you should, you, if you're partaking of Christ then he's everything. Then it should be, you know, God, I'm seeking my whole life to live for your honor and your glory. Because this blessing that we have in Christ, it's the communion of the body of Christ. It's this fellowship with Jesus is what the word communion means. It's this fellowship in the body of Christ. And there is meant to be a place of that, that where we see that, that we recognize just the fullness of the life that now we live for him. Paul would say it this way in 2 Corinthians. He says, this is the way I figure it out. Since God gave everything for me, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, it just makes sense that I, give, that I live my life now for him. You know, that my life just is lived back as a sacrifice to him. He'd go on here in, in, in chapter 12 of our 1 Corinthians. He'll say, you know, here's how we figure it. You know, be, you know therefore, because of, of all the grace that's been given to us, that we now live our lives as a living sacrifice to him maybe that's where it needs to take place. Again, not for everybody, but for some here this evening, that's where it is for you. You don't wrestle with gray areas because in one sense, you're not all in. It isn't a place of you're recognizing that Jesus is everything and surrendering to it. Hey, this is a good moment to get that and come back and say, no, this is what I am. I, I want this. And to look upon one that lived out everything that we've just said. He did everything for the glory of God obtained all that God had for him, loved other people to the max, and calls us to do the same. So there's a number of places where that could meet you this evening, but I just want to invite you to that, to a time that we're going to take communion. You guys know how we do this, but I'm going to kind of just remind you right now, we're going to close with three songs. In the midst of those three songs, we're going to give you the opportunity to take communion. We're going to put communion, just a couple of them up here, and then I know the baptism thing's in the way, so it'll be over on the other side, so that you guys can come down the aisle there, you can get to that, and the others will be over here. And whenever you want, we just want to invite you to take communion. There's not a rush. We're going to ask you to stay for all three songs. So what that would mean is that maybe, you know, you'd want to come up right away and then take communion and then go back to your chair and then continue worshiping with us for a couple songs. That would be great. Or maybe you want to wait. Again, we're going to do three songs of worship. And in the midst of that, whenever you're ready, you can take communion. 
You can come up here and, and, and take it up here. You could kneel, you could stand, you could take it back to the chair where, you, where you're sitting. I mean, just wherever the Lord meets with you, but longing for it to be something that's more than just going through the motions, a place where you would recognize just the fullness of what that is, of, of him just appealing to us, saying, you know, that this is what we are. And calling us in that sense to be just fully surrendered to him. So just inviting you to do that. So once more, three songs, whenever you're ready, take communion and then head back to your seat, continue worshiping with us and the end of those songs will close. But right now, let's just pursue and ask that God would meet us in this time. Father, I think about the opportunity that we have right here and right now to consider Jesus, to consider your death and your resurrection. Father, I'm asking for any here that that needs to be almost an intervention in their life right now, that you would do that. Lord, if there's anyone right now here that doesn't know you, that in one sense doesn't have a relationship with you, you said every time we take of communion, we're proclaiming your death. God, I pray that you'd bring these to you, to your sacrifice, to your just abundant provision for them. And you bring them to you this evening. God, I ask for any that are yours, and yet they're living lives that are so far off course, either legalistically or selfishly, and that right now you would bring them back to a place of living a very different life, one that's lived for your pleasure, your honor, your glory, one that passionately wants all that you have for them, not falling short of that, Lord, as we consider just what this is, what communion is, and the pictures that are found there, that the full sacrifice that you gave, prompting our full surrender to you, God, we ask that you'd make it that effective and that real. And that in this time of taking communion, that it would be so real with us. God, we ask for that and just surrender this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All who are thirsty And all who are weak Come to the fountain Pure heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away waves of his mercy as deep cries out too deep we sing come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus All who are thirsty And all who are weak Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed in waves of his mercy as deep cries out to
We sing, come Lord Jesus, come. Come Lord Jesus, come. Come Lord Jesus. Spirit, we do ask that you would do your work in this place even now, just moving in our hearts, Lord. Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Redemption's hill where your blood was spilled for my ransom and everything I once held dear I count it all as loss lead me to the cross where your love poured out Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me, lead me to the cross. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross when your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. To your heart, to your heart, lead me to your heart, lead me 
into your heart lead me to the cross where your love poured out bring me to my knees lord i lay me down rid me of myself i belong to you forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again let's sing that again I'm forgiven I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned I am alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Amazing love, how can it be? You, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. Let me honor you. I'm forgiven. You were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Amazing love Amazing love How can it be that you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be? That you, my King, would die for me Amazing love I know it's true It's my joy to honor you In all I do Let me honor you In all I do Let me honor you in all I do, let me honor you. Well, Father, you have demonstrated amazing love in giving us your son. Your son dying in our place on the cross. The penalty that was ours, Lord, imputed to him. Our sin placed on his shoulders. And, and Lord, when you didn't need to, 
when we didn't deserve it, you died in our place. And, and Lord, I just pray that tonight we would, we would be so reminded of that. And Lord, it would spur us on towards godliness, Lord, that we would not be partakers of demons and at the same moment think we can be partakers of you, that we wouldn't be thinking that we can get away with living both ways or living a double life. But Lord, that we would be all in, all in. Lord, move us to that place tonight. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that our sin has not cut us off forever. But you've been gracious, Lord, and you've restored us. We thank you so much for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.